Chapter Four of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One day I was sitting in gloomy abstraction in the sunny garden when, looking up suddenly, a little maid stood by demurely and somewhat compassionately regarding me. Grateful just then for any sort of sympathy, I led her to talk and presently found, as we thawed into good fellowship, drawn together by some mutual attraction that she was of british birth and more from my old village this was bond enough in my then state but think how moved and pleased i was when the comely little damsel laughingly said oh yes it is only you roman lords who come and go more often than these flowers we british seldom move i and my people have lived yonder on the coast for ages so i let my lonely fancy fill in the blanks and took the little maid for a kinswoman and was right glad to know someone in the void world into which four hundred years sleep had plunged me strange too as you will take it numidia who now and then to my mind was so like the ancestress she knew naught of numidia the slave-girl who had stood before me by predestined chance in that hour of sorrow it was she who directed my destiny and saved and ruined me in this chapter just as her mother had done distant lifetimes before between this fair little friend and my inexhaustible wallet i dried up my grief and turned idle and reckless in that fascinating town of extravagance and debauchery it was not a time to boast much of the degenerate romans had lost all their valour and most of their skill in the arts of government all their hardihood and strength had sunk under the evil example of the debased capital by the tiber and though some few unpopular ones among them railed against the effeminate luxury of the times few heeded and none were warned it shamed me to find that all these latter-day romans thought of was silks and linens front seats at the theatre pageantry and spectacles trinkets and scents it roused my disdain to see the senators go by with gilded trains of servitors and the young centurions swagger down the streets in their mock armour their toy peacetime swords hanging in golden chains from their tender sides and the wind warning of their perfumed presence even before they came in sight such were not the men to win an empire i thought or to hold it as for the native british a modicum of them had dropped the sargum for the toga and had put on with it all its vices but few of its virtues such a witless vain incapable medley of arrogant fools never before was seen to their countrymen they represented themselves as possessed of all the keys of statecraft and government stirring them up as far as they durst to discontent and rebellion while to their masters they stood acknowledged sycophants and apes of all the meannesses of a degenerate time all this was more the pity for magnificent and wide were the evidences of what rome had done for britain during the long years she had held it when i slept it was a chaotic wild peopled by brave but scattered tribes when i awoke it was a fair united realm a beautiful territory of fertility rich in corn and apple yards arteried by smooth white paved roads and ruled by half a dozen wonderful capitals with countless lesser cities camps and villas wherein modern luxury like a rampant beautiful flowered parasite had overgrown and choked and killed the sturdy stuff on which it grew well it is not my province to tell you of these things the gilded fops who thronged the city ways i soon found were good enough for drinking bouts and revelry and by all olympus my sleep had made me thirsty and my sorrow full of a moroseness which had to be constantly battened down under the hatches of an artificial pleasure all the old cautious frugal merchant spirit had gone and the roman fra in his gold and turquoise cincture his belt full of his outlandish never-failing coins was soon the talk of the town the life and soul of every reckless bout or folly the terror of all lictors and honest benighted citizens and like many another good man of like inclinations his exit was as sudden as his entry 
well i remember that day when my ivory tablets were crowded with suggestions for new idleness and vanities and bore a dozen or two of merry engagements to plays and processions and carnivals and all my new-found world looked like a summer sea of pleasure under these circumstances i went to my hoard one evening as i had done very often of late and was somewhat chagrined to discover only five pieces of money left however they were big plump ones larger than any i had used before and as all those had been good gold these still might mean a long spell of frolic for me when they were nearly spent it would be time to turn serious i at once sat down to rub the general green tint of age from one noticing it was more verdant than any of its comrades had been and rubbed with increasing consternation and alarm moment after moment until i had reduced it at last to an ancient british copper token a base abominable thing not good enough to pitch to a starving beggar another and another was snatched up and chafed and as i toiled on by my little flickering earthen lamp in my bachelor cell every one of those traitor coins in an hour had shed its coating of time and turned out under my disgusted fingers common plebeian metal there they lay before me at length a contemptible five pence wherewith to carry on a week's carousing five pence why it was not enough to toss to a noisy beggar outside the circus hardly enough for a drink of detestable british wine let alone a draught of the good italian vintages that i had lately come to look upon as my prerogative horrible and as i gazed at them stolidly that melancholy evening the airy castle of my pleasure crumbled from base to battlement as the result of long cogitation knowing the measure of my friends too well to think of borrowing of them i finally decided to make a retreat and leave my acquaintance my still unblemished reputation in pawn for the various little items owing by me taking a look round to assure myself every one in the house was asleep i argued that to-night though a pauper i was still of good account whereas with daylight i should be a discredited beggar so that it was in fact a meritorious action to leave my host an old pair of sandals in lieu of a month's expenses and drop through the little window into the garden on the way to the open world once more necessity is ever a sophist it is needless to say that the grey dawn was not particularly cheerful as i sprang into the city fosse and struck out for the woods beyond the fortune which makes a man one day a gentleman of means and the next a mendicant is more pleasant to hear of when it has befallen one's friends than to feel at first hand it was only the fear of the detestable city jail and the abominable provender there added to the ridicule of my friends perhaps that sent me scripless thus afield grey as the prospect ahead might be behind it was black so i plodded on with my spear for a staff and melancholy for a companion the leafy shades reached in an hour or so invited rest and in their seclusion an idle spell was spent watching through the green frame of branches the fair careless city below wake to new luxurious life watching the blue smoke rise from the temple courtyards and the pigeons circling up into the sky and the glitter of the sun on the legionaries arms as they wheeled and formed and reformed in the open ground beyond the prefect's house oh yes i knew it all and how pleasantly the water spluttered in the marble baths after those dusty exercises and how heavy the lightest armour was after such nights as i and those jolly ones down there were accustomed to spend as i breakfastless leant upon the top of my staff i recalled the good red wine from my host's coolest cellars and the hot bread from slaves ovens in the street and how pleasant it was to lie in silk and sandals and drink and laugh in the shade and stare after the comely british maids and lay out in those idle sunny hours the fabrics of fun and mirth on again and by midday a valley opened before me and at the head a mile or so from the river was a very stately white villa thither out of curiosity 
my steps were turned and i descended upon that lordly abode by coppices ferny brakes and pastures until one brambly field alone separated us an ordinary being whom the fates had not set themselves to bandy for ever in their immortal hands would have gone round this enclosure and so taken the uneventful pathway but not so i i must needs cross the brambles and thus bring down fresh ventures on my head in the midst of the enclosure was an oak and under the oak five or six white cows with a massive bull of the fierce old british breed this animal resented my trespass and shaking his head angrily as i advanced he came after me at a trot when half way across now a good soldier knows when to run no less than when to stand and so my best foot was put forth in the direction of the house and i presently slipped through a hole in the fence directly into the trim gay garden of the villa itself so hasty was my entry that i nearly ran into a stately procession approaching down one of the well-kept terraces intersecting the grounds a seneschal and a butler a gorgeously arrayed mercenary or two men and damsels in waiting all this lordly array attending a litter borne by two negro slaves whereon with a languidness like that of convalescence belied however by the bloom of excellent health and the tokens of robust grace in the every limb reclined a handsome roman lady there was hardly time to take all this in at a glance when the gorgeous attendant set up a shout of consternation and alarm and glancing over my shoulder to see the cause there was that resentful bull bursting the hedge a scanty twenty paces away with vindictive purpose in his wide-spread nostrils and angry eyes down went the seneschal's staff of office down went the base mercenary's gilded shields the butler threw the dish of grapes he was carrying for his lady's refreshment into the bushes the waiting-maids dropped their fans and shrieking joined the general rout worse than all those base villains the littermen slipped their leather straps and in the general panic dropped the litter and left to her fate that mistress who with her sandalled feet wrapped in silks and spangled linens struggled in vain to rise there was no time for fear i turned and as the bull came down upon us too in a snorting avalanche of white hide and sinew i gave him the spear driving it home with all my strength just in front of the ample shoulder as he lowered his head the strong seven-foot haft of ash as thick as a man's wrist bent between us like a green hazel wand and then burst into splinters right up to my grasp the next moment i was hurled backwards crashing into the flowers and trim parterres as though it were by the fist of jove himself i had been struck hardly touching the ground i was up again my short sword drawn and ready as ever though the gay world swam before me to kill or to be killed it was not necessary there had been few truer or more forceful spears than mine in the old times and there lay the great white monster on his side in a crimson pool of blood essaying in vain to lift his head and dying in mighty tremors all among the pretty things the servants had thrown down the gush of red blood from his chest was wetting even the silken fringes of the comely dame's skirts and wrappings while she now at last on her feet frowned down on him with angry triumph rather than fear in her countenance though there was hardly a change of colour on her face or a tremor in the voice with which she thanked me yet i somehow felt her ladyship was in a fine passion behind that disdainful mask but whether it were so or not she was civil enough to me personally evincing a condescending interest in a trifling wound that was staining my bare right arm with crimson and sending her good youth away in a minute or two to the house to get it bound as i turned to go the stately lady gathered up tunic folds and skirt in her white fist and moved down upon the group of trembling servants who were gathering their wits together slowly under the nervous encouragement of the seneschal what she said to them i know not but if ever the countenances of men truly reflected their sensations 
her brief fierce whispers must have been exceedingly unpleasant to listen to the damsel who bound the scratch upon my shoulder told me something of this beautiful and wealthy dame but in truth when she called her lady electra i needed to hear little more it was a name that had circulated freely in the city yonder and especially when wine was sparkling best and tongues at lightest i knew without asking the lady was niece to an emperor and was reputed as haughty and cruel as though she had been one of the worst herself i knew her lawful spouse was away like most romans from his duty just then and she stood in his place to tyrannise over the british peasants and sweep the taxes into his insatiate coffers i knew too why rome was forbidden for a time to the vivacious lady as well as some stories best untold of how she enlivened the tedium of her exile in these savage places in fact i knew i had fallen into the gilded hold of a magnificent outlaw one of the worst productions of a debased and sinking state and being wayward by predestination i determined to play with the she-wolf in her own den no fancy of mine is so rash but that fate will countersign it when electra sent for me presently in the great hall where the fountains played into basins of rosy marble it was to inform me that the destruction of the bull and my bearing thereat had caught her fancy and i was to consider myself for the present in her private service and attached to the bodyguard this decision was announced with an easy imperialness which seemed to ignore all suggestion of opposition a suavity such as juno might use in directing the most timorous of servitors so as my wishes ran in unison i bowed my thanks and kissed the fringe of my ladyship's cloak and thought as she lay there before me on her silken couch in the tessellated hall of her stately home that i had never before seen so beautiful or dangerous looking a creature nor had i long to wait for a sight of the vice-prefect's talons while she asked me of my history the which i made up as i told it and having once thus bought the truth never afterwards told her the real facts a messenger came and standing at a respectful distance saluted his mistress ah she said with a pretty look of interest in her face and rising on her elbow are they dead one is madam the man responded one of your bearers fled but the other we secured we took him into the field and tied him as your ladyship directed to the horns of the strongest white cow she dragged him here and there and gored him for full ten minutes before he died and now all that remains of him with a wave of the hand towards the vestibule most respectfully awaits your ladyship's inspection in the porch and the messenger bowed low it is well fling the dog into a ditch and my friend let my brave henchmen know if they do not lay hands on the other villain before sunset to-morrow i shall come to them for a substitute the successful termination of this episode seemed to relieve my new mistress ah my excellent soldier she said with a pretty sigh you cannot conceive what a vexation my servants are to me or how rebellious and unruly would there were but a man here such as yourself for instance to protect and soften a lonely matron's exile this was very flattering to my vanity more especially as it was accompanied by a gracious look with more of condescension in it than i fancied usually fell to the lot of those who met her handsome eyes in such circumstances under a lordly roof and careless again of to-morrow a new spell of experience was commenced in the roman villa and i learnt much of the ways of corrupt roman government and a luxurious society there which might amuse you were it not all too long to set down for a time when her ladyship gave as was her frequent pleasure gorgeous dinners and all the statesmen and soldiers of the neighbouring towns came in to sup with her i pleaded one thing and another in excuse for absence from the places where i must have met many too well known before but electra as the time went on was proud of her handsome stalwart centurion and advanced me quicker than my modest ambition could demand clothed me in the gorgeous livery of her household troops raised me to the chief command and finally one evening sat me at her side on her own silken couch before all the lords and senators and 
deriding their surprise and covert sarcasm proclaimed me first favourites there with royal effrontery did i but say electra was proud of her new find much better had it been simply so but she was not accustomed to moderation in any matters and perhaps my cold indifference to her overwhelming attractions when all else fawned for an indulgent look excited her fiery thirst of dominion be this as it may not a very long time after my arrival it was palpable her manner was changing and as the days went by and she would have me sit on the tiger-skin at her knee a second antony to this british cleopatra telling wonderful tales of war and woodcraft i suddenly found the unmistakable light of awakening love shining through her ladyship's half-shut lids many and many a time before and since has that beacon been lit for me in eyes of every complexion it makes me sad to think how well i know that gentle gleam but never in all my life did i experience anything like the concentrated fire that burnt silently but more strongly day by day in those black roman eyes i would not be warned more i took a lawless delight in covertly piling on material and leading that reckless dame who had used and spurned a score of gallant soldiers or great senators according to her idle fancy to pour out her over ample affection on me the penniless adventurer and like one who fans a spark among combustible material the blaze that resulted was near my undoing the more dense i was to her increasing love the more she suffered truly it was pitiful to see her who was so little accustomed to know any other will thwarted by so fine an agency to see her imperialness strain and fret at the secret meshes of love and fume to have me know and answer to her meaning yet fear to tell it and at times be timorous to speak and as others start up palely wrathful that she could not order in this case as elsewhere indeed my lady was in a bad way and now she would be fierce and sullen and anon gracious and melancholy in the latter mood she said one day as i sat by her bicellium i am ill and pale my centurion i wonder you have not noticed it perhaps madam i said with the distant respect that galled her so perhaps your ladyship's supper last night was over large and late and those lampreys i warned you against them that third time gross material exclaimed electra frowning blackly guess again a finer malady a subtler pain then maybe the valley air affects my lady's liver or rheumatism perhaps exacts a penalty for some twilight rambles such banter as this and more was all the harder to bear since she could not revenge it i was sorry for the tyrantess for she was wonderfully attractive thus pensive wise and woefully in earnest as she turned away to the painted walls and sighed to herself fie to be thus withstood by a fameless mercenary why thus must i unaccustomed sue this one the least worthy of them all and lavish on his dull plebeian ears the sighs that many another would give a province or two to hear i who have slighted the homage of silk and scarlet and imperial purple even lucullus was not half so dull or palladius or decius and that last of many others my witty publius torquatus would have diagnosed my disease and prescribed for it all in one whisper poor lady it was not within me though she did not know it to hold out for long against the sunshine and storm of her impetuous nature neither her abominable cruelties nor her reckless rapacity could suffice to dim her attractions many a time since when that comely personage has been as clearly wiped from the page of life as utterly obliterated from the earth as the very mound of her final resting-place have i regretted that she was not born to better days and then perchance her fine material might have been run into a nobler mould she was jealous too and it came about in this way very soon after i had taken service with her whom should i espy one morning feeding the golden pheasants outside the veranda but my little friend numidia 
often i had thought of that maid and determined to discover that big house where she told me she was bondwoman and the great lady who sent her tripping long journeys into the town for the powders and silk stuffs none could better choose and now here she was on my path again a roof-mate by strange chance with her graceful tender figure and her dainty ways and that chronic friendly smile upon her mouth that brought such strange fancies to my mind every time i looked upon it of course i befriended the maid as though she were my own little one not so many times removed and equally of course lady electra noticed and misread our friendship poor numidia she had a hard life before i came and a harder perhaps afterwards you compassionate moderns will wonder when i tell you that numidia has shown me her white silk shoulders laced with the red scars of old floggings laid on by electra herself and the blood-spotted dimples here and there where the imperious dame had thrust for some trivial offence a golden bodkin from her hair deep into that innocent flesh no one knew better than my noble mistress how to give acute torture to a slave without depreciating the market price of her property but when i became of more weight when in brief my comely tigress was too fast bound to be dangerous i spoke up and electra grew to be jealous and to hate the small christian slave-girl with all the unruly strength that marked her other passions thus one day having discovered numidia weeping over a new-made wound i sought out the offender and as she sauntered up and down her tessellated pavements i shook my fist at her queenship and said by that bright flame of vesta lady electra and by every deity old or new in the endless capacity of the skies if you get out your abominable flail for that girl again or draw but once upon her one of your accursed bodkins i will marry her among the smoking ruins of this white sty of yours while i spoke to her thus under the lash of my anger she would uprise to the topmost reach of her height and thence frowning down upon me her shapely head tossed back and her draperies falling from her crossed arms and ample shoulders to the marble floor she would regard me with an imperious stare that might have withered an ordinary mortal so beautiful and statuesque was her ladyship on these occasions towering there in her own white hall like an image of an offended juno in the first flush of her queenly wrath that even i would involuntarily step back a pace but i did not cower or drop my eyes and when we had glowered at each other so for a minute or two the royal instinct within her was no match for traitor love slowly then the woman would come welling into her proud face and the glow of anger gave way upon her cheeks her arms dropped by her sides she shrank to mortal proportions and lastly sank on the ebony and ivory couch in a wild gust of weeping woefully asking to know as i turned upon my heels why the slave's trivial scars were more to me than the mistress's tears my vice-prefect was avaricious too there was stored in the spacious hollows below her villa i knew not how much bronze and gold squeezed from those reluctant british hinds whose old-world huts clustered together in the oak clumps dotting the fertile vales as far as the eye could see from our roof ledges on every hand had all the offices of the imperial government been kept as she kept her duties of tax collecting the great empire would have been further by many a long year from its ruin and the closer electra made her accounts the more deadly became her exactions the more angry and rebellious grew the natives round us already they had heard whispers of how hard barbarians were pressing upon rome day by day they saw britain depleted of the stalwarts legionaries who had occupied the land four hundred years and as phalanx after phalanx went south through gaul to protect the mother city on the tiber their demagogues secretly stirred the people up to ambition and discontent nor can it be denied the villains had something to grumble for society was dissolute and debased while the country was full of those who made the good roman name a byword the british peasant had to toil and sweat 
that a hundred tyrants the rank production of social decay might squander and parade in the luxury and finery his labour purchased added to this the pressing needs of the emperor himself demanded the services of those who had taken upon themselves for centuries the protection of the country as they retired northern rovers at first fitfully but afterwards with increasing rigour came down upon the unguarded coasts and sailing up the estuaries harried the rich english vales on either side and rioted amid the accumulated splendour and plenty of the luckless land to their hearts content saddled thus with the weight of luxurious conquerors who had lost nearly every art but that of extortion miserable at home and devastated from abroad who can wonder that the british longed to throw off the roman yoke and breathe the fresher air of a wholesome life again and as the shadow of the imperial wings was withdrawn from them their hopes ripened they thought they were strong and rule-worthy fatal mistake i saw its bud and i saw it bitterly fruitful if you turn back the pages of history you will find these hinds did indeed make a stand for a moment and when honorius had withdrawn his last legionaries and given the islanders their liberty for a few brief years there was a shepherd government here the british ruled again in britain then came the next strong tide of northern invasion and another conquest i well remember how in the throes of the first great change that heralded a new era in britain the herdsmen and serfs were crushed between waning roman terrors such as electra wielded and the growing horrors of the northmen of these latter i saw something on one occasion when the storm was brewing i was away down the coast provinces hunting wolves and thus by chance fell in with a sea king's foray and a british reprisal on that occasion the spoilers were spoilt and we taught the northern ravishers a lesson which had they been more united so that such a blow might have been better felt by the whole would have damped their ardour for a long time as it was to rout and destroy their scattered parties was but like mopping up the advancing tide of those salt waves that brought them on us those down there by the kentish shore had been unmolested for some years they had lived at their leisure had got their harvests in had rebuilt their villages out in the open and set up forges and hammered spearheads and bosses rings for their women of silver and brass and chains and furniture for their horses of gold shearing their flocks and living as though such things as norsemen were not when one day the infliction came upon them again it was a gusty morning in early summer i remember it well and most of the men were from the villages hunting when away towards the coast went up the brightening sky a thin curl of smoke followed by another and another the sight was understood only too well line after line crept up in the silence of the morning over the green tree-tops and against the grey of the sea while groups of black figures flying villagers we knew them to be went now and then over the skyline of the wolds into the security of the valleys to the right and left as the wail went up from the huts where i rested a mounted chief his toes in the iron rings of his stirrups and his wolf-skins flying from his bare shoulders came pounding through the woods with the bad news the raiders were close behind rapid packing was a great feminine accomplishment in those days and while the women swept their children and more portable valuables into their cloths and disappeared into the forest we sent the quickest footed youths that were with us to call back the hunters and made our first stand there round the huts and mounds of the old village of can edron and we kept its thatch and shackles inviolate for by this time the countryside was all in arms and as the sea was far behind them the despoilers but showed themselves on the fringe of the open exchanged a javelin or two and turned hot on their track that morning of vengeance we went after them over the scrubby open ground and down through the tangles of oak and hazel we pressed them back past the charred and smoking remnants of the villages they had burnt back by the streams that still ran streaky in quiet places with blood 
back down the red path of ruin and savagery they had trodden back by the cruel finger-posts of dead women back by the halting places of the ravishers ever drawing new recruits and courage till we outnumbered them by six to one and thus we trampled that day on the heels of those laden pirates from the valley-head down to the shore it was a time of vengeance and our women and children crowded singing and screaming after us to kill and torture the wounded every now and then those surly spoilers turned and we fled before them as the dogs fly from a big boar who goes to bay but each time we came on again and their standing places by the coverts and under the lichened rocks were littered with dead and all bestrewn amid the ferns in the pink morning light was the glittering spoil they disgorged truly that was an hour of victory and the britons were drunk with success they followed like starving wolves after a herd of deer leaping from rock to rock crowding every point of vantage and running and yelling through the underwood until surely the northmen must have thought the place in possession of a legion of devils but all this noise was as nothing to the frightful yell of savage joy which went up from us when we saw the raiders draw together on the shingle ridge of the beach and knew instinctively by their pale tidewood faces and hesitation that they were trapped the sea was out and their ships were high and dry somehow i scarcely know how it was when those men turned grimly and prepared to make their last stand under their ships a strange silence fell upon both bands and for a minute or two the long wild rank of our warriors halted at the bottom of the slope every man silent and dumb by a strange accord while opposite against the skyline were the mighty norsemen clustered together and looking down with fierce sullen brows equally silent and expectant while the sun glistened on their rustling arms and tall peaked casks we stood thus a minute or two and i heard the thumpings of my own heart like an echo of the low wash of the far-away sea a plover piping overhead and a raven croaking on the distant hills but not another sound until suddenly some british women who had come red-handed to a mound behind broke out into a wild war-song then the spell was loosed and we were again at them sweeping the sea-kings from the ridge into the tangle of long grass and sand and stunted bushes that led to the shore and there separated but dying stubbornly powerless against our numbers pulled them down and killed them one by one lopping their armour from them and stripping their cloths till the pleasant lichened alleys of the seashore wood and the green footways of the moss were stamped full of crimson puddles and littered with the naked bodies of those tawny giants the last man to fall was a chief twice i had seen him hard pressed and had lifted my javelin to slay him but a touch of silly compunction had each time held my hand and now he stood with his back to his ship like some fierce beautiful thing of the sea his plated brass and steel cuirass was hacked and dinted his white linen hung in shreds about him his arms were bare and blood ran down them while his long fair hair lifted to the salt wind that was coming in freshly with the tide and the sun shone on his cold blue eyes and his polished harness and his tall and comely proportions standing out there against the dark side of his high-sterned vessel but what cared the britons for flaxen locks or the goodliness of a young thor he had in his hands a broken spear his own sword being snapped in two and with this weapon he lay about fiercely every now and then as the men edged in upon him luckless viking there is no retreat or rescue he was bleeding heavily and even as i watched his chin sank upon his chest at once the britons ran in upon him but the life flared up again and the gallant robber crushed in a pair of heads with his stave and sent the others flying back still glaring upon the wide circle of his enemies with death and defiance struggling for mastery in his eyes in a way wonderful to behold again and again the yellow head of the young thor nodded and sank and again and again he started up and scowled upon them 
as each savage cry of joy to see him thus bleeding to death fell upon his ears presently he wavered for a moment and leaned his shoulder against the black side of his ship and his lids dropped wearily at once the britons rushed and when i turned my face there again they were hacking and stripping the armour from a mutilated but still quivering corpse a few such episodes as this repulse of the northmen magnified and circulated with all the lying exaggeration that a coward race ever wraps about his feats of arms made the britons bold and their boldness brings me to the end of my chapter many a pleasant week and month did i live and enjoy all the best things life has to give the master of my roman mistress the foremost spearman where the boar went to bay among the rocks on the hillside the jolliest fellow that was ever invited to a lordly banquet the penniless adventurer whose fortune every one envied and then fate put me by again and wiped my tablets clean for another frolic epoch it came about this way the british grew more and more unruly as time went on and legion after legion left us at length when the last of the romans were down to the coast about to embark electra made up her mind to go too and with all her hordes but in this latter particular the new authorities in the neighbouring town could not concur and they sent two brand new civilian senators to expostulate and detain her the last representative of the old rule electra had these gentlemen stripped in the vestibule and flogged within an ace of their lives and then them sent home bound in a mean country cart all that afternoon we were busy sewing up the gold and bronze in bags and by dusk a long train of mules set out for the coast in charge of a score of our mercenaries who having served a long apprenticeship to cruelty and extortion had more to fear from the natives than even we nor was it too soon as the last of the convoy went into the evening darkness electra and i ascended the flat wide roof of her home and there we saw westwards under the stormy red of the setting sun the flashing of arms and the dust wreaths against the glow which hung above the bands of people moving out and bearing down on us in a mood one well could guess her ladyship having safely packed was disdainful and angry her fine lips curled as she watched the grey column of citizens swarming out to the assault but when her gaze wandered over the fair valleys she had ruled and bled so long she was perhaps a little regretful and softened my good and stalwart captain she said coming near to me yonder sun i fear will never rise again on a roman briton we must obey the fates you know what i would do had i the power to yonder scum but since we must desert this house to them as i see too clearly we must how can we best ensure the safety of the treasure we arranged there and then with small time for parley that i should stay with a handful of her mercenaries and make a stand about the villa while she with the last of her servants should go on and hurry up by every means in her power the slow caravan of her wealth in truth my mistress was as brave as she was overbearing and but for those endless shining bags of gold i do believe she would have stayed and fought the place with me as it was she reluctantly consented to the plan and bid me adieu which i returned but coldly and came back again for another kiss and said another good-bye and hung about me and enjoined caution and held my hands and looked first into my eyes and then back into the darkness where the laden mules were as much in love as a rustic maid as anxious as a usurer and torn and distracted between these contending feelings at last she and all the women were gone whereon with a lighter mind we set ourselves down to cover their retreat here it must be confessed that for myself i was ill at ease treachery lurked within me i had grown somewhat weary of her ladyship nor had longer a special wish to be dragged in her golden chains the restless spirit chance had bred within moved and i had determined to see my enamoured vice-prefect safe to her ships and then if i could if i dared break with her 
i well knew the wild tornado of indignation and love this would call up and hence had not confessed my intentions earlier but had been cold and distant the dame you will see presently had been sharper in guessing than i supposed we made such preparation as we could with the small time at our disposal barricading the white facade of the villa and closing all approaches then we pulled the winter stacks to pieces in the yard making two great mounds of faggots in front of the porch pouring oil upon each and stationing a man to fire them by way of torches at a given signal my hope was that as the wide roman way ran just below the villa the avengers of the ambassadors would not think of passing on until they had demolished the house and us of the loyalty of the few men with me i had little fear they were brave and stubborn all their pay was on electra's mules and the british hated them without compunction there were in our little company that black evening seven wild welshmen under a shaggy-haired blue-eyed princeling gwallon of the bow he called himself fifteen swarthy iberians all teeth and scimitar a handful of belgic mercenaries with great double-headed axes but never a roman among them all in this last stand of roman power in britain was i a roman i wondered as i stood on the terrace waiting the onset of the liberated slaves what was i who was i how came it that he who was first in repelling the stalwart roman adventurers of endless years before was the last to lift a sword in their defence and more personally was this night to be as it greatly seemed the last of all my wild adventures or had fate infinite others in store for her bantling you will guess how i wondered and speculated as my golden roman armour clanked to my gloomy stride in electra's empty corridors and the wet fleecy clouds drifted fitfully across the face of a broad full moon and a thousand things of love or sorrow crowded on my busy mind we had not long to wait however in an hour the mob came scuffling round the bend shouting disorderly with innumerable torches borne aloft and they set up a yell when they caught sight of our shining white walls silently agleam in the moonlight there could be no parley with such a leaderless rush and we attempted none without a thought of discipline they stormed the pastures and swarmed into the garden a motley angry crowd armed with scythes and hooks and axes and apparently all the town pressing on behind well we fired our faggots and they gleamed up fiercely to welcome the scullion levies to their doom never did you see such a ruddy wild scene such a motley parody of noble war the bright flames leapt into the tranquil sky in volcanoes of spark and hissing tongues the british rushed at us between the fires like imps of darkness and we met them face to face and slew them like the dogs they were in a few minutes we were hemmed in the veranda under whose columns we had some shelter and then my brave welshmen showed me how they could pull their longbows which indeed they did in right good earnest until all the trim terraces were littered with writhing howling foemen but again they drove us back this time into the house and there we soon had a better light to fight by for the sparks had caught the roof and soon everything far and near was ablaze every man with me that night fought like a patrician and electra's polished floors were slippery with blood her pretty walls with their endless painted garlands of oak and myrtle their cooing doves and tender cupids were horribly besmeared and smudged and her marble pillars were chipped by flying javelins and gashed by random axe strokes ten times we hurled ourselves upon the invaders and drove them staggering backwards over the slippery pavements into the passages sixteen men had fallen to my own arm alone and we crammed their bodies into the doorways for barricade but it would not do the sheer weight of those without made the men within brave against their will nothing availed the stinging shafts of my welshmen the iberian scimitars played hopelessly like summer lightning in the glare upon a solid wall of humanity 
and the german axis could make no pathway through that impenetrable civilian tangle overhead and among us the smoke curled and eddied and the flames behind it made it like a hot noonday in our fighting place and in the wreaths of that pungent vapour circling thick and yellow in the great open-roofed hall of the noble roman villa her ladyship's statues of fawn and satyr still fluted and grinned imbecilely as though they liked the turmoil niobe wept for new griefs as the marble little ones at her feet were calcined before her eyes and the gorgon head wore a hundred frightful snakes of flame the pale proud pallas athene of the greeks looked disdainfully on the dying barbarians at her feet and pan himself in bronze leered on us through the reek until his lower limbs grew white hot and gave way and down he came whereon a mighty briton heaved him up by his head and with this hissing glowing flail carried destruction and confusion among us it was so hot in that flaming marble battle-place that foreigner and briton broke off fighting now and then to kneel together for a moment at the red fountain basins where the jet still played for the fugitives had forgotten to turn them off and quenched their thirst in hurried gasps ere flying again at each other's throats and so wild the confusion and uproar and so dense the smoke and flame so red and slippery were the pavements and so thick the dead and dying that hardly one could tell which were friends and which foes for an hour we kept them at bay and then when my arms ached with killing all on a sudden the face of a man unknown to me whom i never had seen before shone in the gleam at my shoulder fra the phoenician he said calling me by an appellation no living man then knew i am bidden to get you hence come to the inner doorway quick i hardly knew what he meant but there was that about him which i could not but obey so i turned and followed his retreating figure i ran with him across the courtyard under the white marble pillars all aglow through the silent banquet hall that had echoed so often to the haughty laughter of my mistress and then when we reached the cool damp outer air like a wreath of mist in november like an eddy among the dead leaves my guide vanished and left me angry and surprised but with no time for wonder i turned back even as i did so there was a mighty crack a groaning of a thousand timbers and there before my very face with a resounding roar electra's lordly mansion and all the wings and buttresses and basements the rooms and colonnades and corridors of that splendid home of luxury and power lurched forward and heaved and collapsed in one mighty red ruin that tinctured the sky from east to west and buried alike in one vast glowing hecatomb besiegers and besieged it had fallen the last stronghold of roman authority and there was nothing more to defend i turned and took me to the quiet forest pathways every nook and bend of which i knew as i ran the sweet moist air of the evening was like an elixir to my heated frame now into the black shadows i plunged and anon brushing the silver moonlight dew from bramble and bracken while a thousand fancies of our stubborn fight danced around me in a little time the road went down to a river that sparkled in flood under the moonbeams here the laden mules had crossed into comparative safety and now i had to follow them with a single guide rope to feel my way alone across the dangerous ford i struggled through the swollen stream safely though it rose high above my waist and then who should loom out of the dark on the far side but electra standing alone and expectant at the brink faithful stately matron she was so glad to see me again i was really sorry i did not love her more i told her something of the fight and she a little of the retreat some time before the long train of mules and slaves had gone on up the steep slowing bank and into the coppice beyond and now i and the roman dame lingered a minute or so by the brink of the turgid stream to see the last flickers of her burning home we were on the point of turning 
indeed lady electra seemed anxious to be gone when stepping out of the dark pathway into a patch of moonlight on the farther shore a little silver casket in her duteous hands and those dainty skirts in which she took so much pride muddy and soiled appeared the poor little slave numidia she tripped fearfully forth from the shadows and down to the brink where the water was swirling against the stones in an ivory and silver inlay and when she saw not perceiving as in the shadows that all the people had gone on and she was deserted to the tender mercies of the foemen behind she dropped her burden and threw up her white clasped hands in the moonlight and wailed upon us in a way that made my steel cuirass too small for my swelling heart surely such a pitiful sight ought to have moved any one yet electra only cursed those nimble feet under her breath and from this though i may do her heavy injustice i have since feared she had planned the desertion and sent the maid back to be killed or taken on some false errand which for her jealous purpose was too quickly executed the noble roman lady pulled me by the hand and would have had me leave the girl to her fate scolding and entreating and when i angrily shook myself free turning her wild untutored passions into the channels of love told me she had guessed my project of leaving her for numidia and clung to me and endeared me and promised me the tallest porch on palatina as i threw off my buckler and broadsword to be lighter in the stream and the whitest arms for welcome there that ever a roman matron spread as i pitched my gilded helmet into the bushes and strode down to the torrent if i would but turn my back once and for all upon my little kinswoman three times the white arms of that magnificent wanton closed round me and three times i wrenched them apart and hurled her back three times she came anew to the struggle squandering her wild queenly love upon me while under the white light overhead the tears shone in her wonderful upturned eyes like very diamonds three times she invoked every deity in the hierarchy of the southern skies to witness her perjured love and cursed for my sake all those absent youths who had fallen before her three times she knelt there on the black and white turf and wrung her fair hands and shook out her long thick hair and came imploring and begging down to the very lapping of the water and there i stood for i too was a southern and could be hot and fierce and spoke such words as she had never heard before abused and scoffed and derided her laughed at her sorrow and mocked her grief and then turned and plunged into the torrent the ford was not long in a minute or two i struggled out on the farther shore and numidia with a cry of pleasure and trustfulness came to my dripping arms the british hot on the track were shouting to one another in the dark pursuit so the little maid was picked up securely and with her in my left arm upon my hip her warm wrists about my neck and my other hand on the guide rope we went back into the stream again by the sacred fane of vesta it ran stronger than a mill sluice and tugged and worried at my limbs like the fingers of a fury i felt the pebbly gravel sifting and rolling beneath my feet and the strong lift of the water as it swirled flying by in the moonlight hissing and bubbling at my heaving chest in a way that frightened me even me at last with my every muscle on fire with the strain and turmoil and my head giddy with the dancing torrent all about it i saw the farther bank loom over us once more and heaving a heavy sigh of fatigue collected myself for one more crowning effort but i had forgotten that royal harpy my mistress and even as i gathered my last strength in the swirl of the black water below she sprang to the verge of the bank overhead vengeance and hatred flashing in the eyes that i had left full of gentleness and tears and gleaming there in her wrath her white robe shining in the moonlight against the ebony setting of the night and glowered down upon us down with the maid she screamed with all the tyrant in her voice down with her centurion or you die together never never i shouted 
for my blood was boiling fiercely and i could have laughed at a hundred such as she but while i shouted my heart sank for electra was terrible to behold an incarnation of beautiful cruelty hot reckless hatred ruling the features that had never turned upon me before but in sweetness and love for one minute the passion gathered head and then while i stood still in the current with dread of the coming deed she snatched my own naked sword from the ground die then she yelled and may a thousand curses weigh down your souls as she said it the blade whirled into the moonlight descending on the guide rope just where it ran taut and hard over the posts severing it clean to the last strands with one blow of those effective white arms and the next minute the hempen cord was torn out of my grasp and over and over in a drowning bewildering cascade of foam we were swept away down the stream it was the wildest swim that ever a mortal took so fiercely did we spin and fly that heaven and earth seemed mixed together and the white clouds overhead were not whiter than the sheets of foam that ran down seawards with us i am a good swimmer but who could make the bank in such a cauldron of angry waters and now numidia was on top and now i it went to my heart to hear the poor little christian gasp out on good saint christopher and to feel the flutter of her breast against my leather jerkin and then presently i did not feel it at all many an island of wreckage passed us but none that i could lay hold on until presently a mighty log came foaming down upon us labouring through that torrent surf like a full-sailed ship as it passed i threw an arm over a strong root and thus for an hour behind that black midnight javelin we flew downwards i know not whither then it presently left the strong stream and towing me towards a soft alluvial beach just as dawn was breaking in the east deposited me there and slowly disappeared again into the void this is all i know of roman britain this is the end of the chapter as i reeled ashore with my burden some friendly fisher folk came forward to help but i saw them not numidia was dead my poor little slave girl the one speck of virtue in that tyrant world and i bent over her and shut her kindly eyes and spread on the sand her long wet braids and smoothed the modest white gown she was so careful of with a heart that was heavier than it ever felt yet in storm or battle then all my grief and exertions came upon me in a flood and the last thing i remember was stooping down in the morning starlight to kiss the fair little maid upon that pallid face that looked so wan and strange amid the wild spread tangles of her twisted hair End of chapter four Chapter five of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When consciousness came to my eyes again, everything around me was altered and strange. The very air I drew in with my faint breaths had a taste of the unknown about it, an impalpable something that was not before, speaking of change and novelty. As for surroundings, it was only dimly that any fashioned themselves before those dull and sleepy eyes of mine that hesitated as they drowsily turned about whether to pronounce this object and that true material substance or still the idle fantasy of dreams as time went on certainty developed out of doubt and i found myself speculating on as strangely furnished a chamber as any one was ever in all round the wall hung the implements of many occupations in bunches and knots here the rude tools of husbandry were laid aside the mattock and the flail the woodman's axe and the neat herd's goad just as though they had been suspended on the wall by some invisible labourer after a good day's work 
yonder were a sheaf of arrows and a stout bow strangely shaped a hunting horn and there again a long withy peeled for fishing and a broad rusty iron sword that truly looked as if it had not been used for some time over against a leash for dogs and a herdsman's cowl with other strange things festooning the walls of this dim little place among those possessions of some many-minded men were shelves i noted with clay vessels of sorts upon them and bunches of dried herbs and roots and apples put by for the winter and more curious still in the safest niche away in the quietest corner were stored up in many tiers more than a score of vellums and manuscripts all neatly rolled and tagged with coloured ribbons and wound in parchments and embroidered gold and coloured leathers forming such a library of learning as only the very studious could possess in those days beyond them were flasks and essences and dried herbs and ink-horns and sheafs of uncut reeds for writing with such other various items as astonished me by their incongruous complexity and novelty all these lay in the shadows most commendable to my weakly eyes as for the centre of the room i now began to notice it was a brilliant golden haze a nebulous cloud of yellow light to my enfeebled sense without form or meaning whence emerged constantly a thin metallic hammering as though it might be some kindly invisible spirits were forging a golden idea into a human hope behind that shining veil i shut my eyes for a minute or two to rest them and then looked again the haze had now concentrated itself into a circle of light radiating as i perceived from a lamp hung from the low roof and under that pale modest radiance seated at a trestle table was a venerable white-bearded old man never so far perhaps in long centuries of intercourse with brave but licentious peoples had a face like his been before me it was restful to look at a new page in history it seemed full of a peace which had hitherto passed all understanding and a dignity beyond description or definition before him on the board was a brilliant mass of shining white metal and as he eagerly bent over it absorbed in his work his thin and scholarly hands wielding a chisel and a mallet and obeying the art that was in his soul caused the rhythmed hammering i had noticed while they forced with loving zeal the bright chips and spiral flakes from the splendid dazzling crucifix he was shaping and all behind that lean and kindly anchorite the black shadows flickered on the walls of his lonely cell and his little fire of sticks burnt dimly on the open hearth and the shining dust of his labour sparkled in his grisly beard as brightly as the reverent pleasure in his eyes while the symbol before him took form and shape so pleasant was he to look upon i could have left him long undisturbed but presently a sigh involuntarily escaped me thereon looking up for the first time from his work the recluse peered all round him into the recesses and seeing nothing fell to his task once more again i sighed and then he arose without emotion or fear and stared intently into the shadows where i lay in vain i essayed to speak my tongue clove to my mouth and naught but a husky rattle broke the stillness at that sound he took down the lamp and came forward wonder and astonishment working in his face and when as the light shone on me with a great effort my head was turned to one side even that placid monk started back and stood trembling a little by the table but he soon mastered his weakness and advanced again muttering as he did so excitedly to himself he was right he was right and when at last my tongue was loosened i said who was right thou grey-bearded chiseller who why alfred alfred the son of ethelwulf the son of egbert alfred the great thane of england one of your british princelings i suppose i muttered huskily and wherein was he so right he was right o oh, marvellous returner from the dim seas of the past in that he prophesied your return to him you owe this shelter and preservation all this may be so my host i replied 
beginning to feel more myself again but it matters not i fought a stubborn fight last night and i was carried away by a midnight torrent if you have sheltered and dried me and with a sudden sinking of my voice if you have protected the little maid i had with me then i am grateful to you alfred or no alfred and i threw off a mountain of mouldy seeming rags and coverlets and staggered up but that worthy monk was absolutely dumb with astonishment and as i tottered to my feet holding out to him a gaunt trembling hand brown with the dust of ages and drunkenly reeled across his floor he edged away while the long hair of his silvery head bristled with wonder my son my son he gasped at length over the shining crucifix this is not so none of us know the beginning of that sleep you have slept that night of yours is of immeasurable antiquity history has forgotten your very battles and your maid i fear has long since passed into common immaterial dust this was too much and suddenly overwhelmed by the tide of hot phoenician passion i shook my fist in his face and swearing in my bitter roman that he lied that he was a grizzle-bearded villain with a heart as black as his tongue i staggered to the doorway and pushing wide the hinges tottered out on to a grassy promontory just as the primrose flush of day was breaking over the hilltops there holding on to a post for my legs were very weak and frail and peering into the purple shadows i lifted my voice in anger and fear and shouted in that green loneliness numidia numidia then waited with a beating heart until thin sullen derisive from the hills across the ravine came back the soulless response numidia numidia, numidia. i could not believe it i would not think they could not hear and stamping in my impatience electra i shouted numidia tis fra fra the friendless who calls to you then again bent an ear to listen until from the void shadows of the purple hills through the pale vapours of the morning mist there came again in melancholy wise the answer tis fra tis fra, fra the friendless fra, who fra, calls friendless. to you and i dropped my face into my hands and bent my head and dimly knew then that i was jettisoned once more on the shore of some unknown and distant time it was of no use to grieve and when the kindly hand of the monk was placed upon my shoulder i submitted to his will and was led back to the cell and there he gave me to drink of a sweet thin decoction that greatly soothed these high-strung nerves then many were the questions that studious man would have me answer and busy his wonder and awe at my assertions what emperor rules here now i said lying melancholy on my elbow on the couch none my son there are no emperors but the sovereign pontiff now may saint peter be his guide no emperor why old man honorius held sway in rome that night i went to sleep honorius said the monk incredulously stopping his excited pacings to stare at me and he took down a portly tome of history and ran his fingers over the leaves until about midway through that volume they settled on a passage look look you marvellous man he cried all this was history before you slumbered and all this nigh as much again has been added while you slept five hundred years of solid life a thousand changing seasons has the germ of existence been dormant in that mighty bulk of yours oh tis past belief and had you not been my lodger for so long a time though all so short in comparison i would not hear of it and how has the world spun all this period i said with dense persistence who is consul now in gaul and are all my jolly friends of the tenth legion still quartered where i left them and i mentioned the name of the town by which electra lived i tell thee youth the priest replied quite hotly there is no consul there are no legions all your barbarous romans are long since swept to hell and the noble harold is here anointed king of saxon england i never heard of him i said coldly 
perhaps not but by the cowl of saint dunstan he flourishes nevertheless responded my saintly entertainer and is this harold of yours successor to the other thane alfred whom you describe as taking such a kindly interest in me yes but many generations separate them it was the great brettwalder you have mentioned who tradition says once found you inanimate yet living in a fisherman's hut where he sheltered one day from a storm and struck by the marvel and the tale of the poor folk that their ancestors had long ago dragged you from a swollen river in their nets and that you slumbered on without alteration or change from year to year from father to son there on your dusty shelf in their peat smoke and broken gear he bought and gave you to the holy prelate at the blessed cathedral of canterbury whence you came a few months ago into my hands all else there is to know my strangely gifted son the monk went on is locked in the darkness of that long slumber and such acts of your other life as your vacant mind may recall this seemed a wonderful thing very briefly told but it was obviously all there was to hear and sufficient after a style the old man said that having a mind for curiosities and observing me once in danger of being broken up as rubbish by careless hands he had claimed me and brought the strange living mummy here to his cell on the hills senlac by the narrow english straits that inscrutable one he added with a twinkle in his eye was only some months ago and the mess i made my hut in cleaning and wiping you down was wonderful yonder little stream you hear prattling in the valley ran dusty for hours with your washings and your form was one shapeless bulk of cobwebs and dishonoured wrappings many a time as i peeled from you the alternate layers of peat smoke and rags with which generations of neglect had shrouded that body did i think to roll you into the valley as you were and see what proportions the weather and the crows would make of it but better counsels prevailed and for seven days you have been free and daily rubbed with scented oils i thanked him meekly and hoped i had not been a reluctant patient a more docile never breathed nor an expensive lodger afterwards never was there one more frugal nor one who less criticised his entertainment then it was the good monk's turn and his wise and kindly eyes sparkled with pleasure and astonishment as i told him in gratitude such tales of the early times drew for him such brilliant fiery pictures on the dark background of the past illumined and vivified his dry histories with the colours of my awakening memory and set all the withered puppets of his chronicles a-dancing in the tinsel and the glitter of their actual lives until over the lintel of his doorway and under the lappets of his roof there came the first thin fine fingers of the morning sunshine trickling into our dim arena thronged thus with shadowy imagery and playing lovingly about the great silver crucifix that lay thus ablaze under it in the gloom then i slept again for two days and two nights as lightly and happily as a child when i woke i was both hungry and well indeed it was the scent of breakfast that roused me but alas the meal was none of mine the little table had been cleared and at it on clean white napkins were places for three or four people there were wooden platters with steel knives upon them oaten loaves great wooden tankards of wine and mead with fish and fowl flesh in abundance surely my entertainer was going to turn out a jolly fellow now the night's vigils were over but as i speculated in my retired couch there fell the beat of marching men a clatter of arms outside a shouting of many voices in clamorous welcome the ringing of stirrup-irons and the champing of bits and then to my infinite astonishment in stalked as comely a man as i had ever seen and leading by the hand a fair pale black-haired girl who looked jaded and red in her eyes there my adeliza he said now dry those lashes of yours and cheer up what a norman girl like you and weeping because two hosts stand faced for battle 
what will our saxon maid say to these shining drops oh harold the girl exclaimed it is not conflict i fear or i would not have come hither to you braving your anger but think of the luckless chance that brings my father from normandy in arms against my saxon love think of my fears think how i dread that either side should win surely grief so complicated should claim pardon for these simple tears well well said he whom i unobserved in the shadows now recognised as the english monarch himself if we are bound to die we can do so but once and at least we will breakfast first and down he sat signing the girl to get herself another stool in rough saxon manner and a very good meal he made of it putting away the toasted ortolans and cheese and waging war with his fingers and dagger upon all the viands washing them down with constant mighty draughts from the wooden flagons and this all in a jolly light-hearted way that was very captivating ever and anon he called to the churls outside or gave a hasty order to his captains with his mouth full of meat and bread or put some dainty morsel into the idle fingers of his damsel as though breakfasting was the chief thing in life and his kingdom were not tottering to the martial tread of an invader but even gallant harold the last king of the saxons had finished presently and then donned his painted casque and his flowing silken filigreed cloak thrusting his winger into his jewelled girdle he threw his round steel target on his back then held out both his arms whether or not his norman love the reluctant seal of a broken promise had always loved him it is not for me to say but woman-like she loved him at the losing and flew to him and was enfolded tight into his ample chest and mixed her raven tresses with his yellow english hair and sobbed and clung to him and took and gave a hundred kisses and was so sweet and tearful that my inmost heart was moved when harold had gone out and when presently the clatter of arms and shouting proved he was moving off to the field of eventful battle adeliza the proud bowed her head upon the table and abandoned herself to so wild a grief that i was greatly impelled to rise and comfort her but she would not be consoled even by the ministrations of two of her waiting-maidens who soon entered the place and seeing this i took an opportunity when all three were blending their tears to slip out into the open air there i found my friendly saxon monk in great tribulation with a fragment of vellum in his hand ah my son he said the very man look here the air is heavy with event yonder under the sheen of the sun william of normandy is encamped with sixty thousand of his cruel adventurers and there down there among the trees you see the gallant harold and his straggling array sorry and muddy with long marching on the way to oppose them but the king has not half his force with him nor a fourth as many as he needs take this vellum and if you ever put a buskin in speed to the grass run now for the credit of england and for the sake of history run for that ridge away there behind us where you will find the good earl of mercia and several thousand men encamped and if not asleep most probably stuffing themselves with food and drink he added bitterly under his breath give him this and say harold will not be persuaded say that unless the reserves march at once the fight will be fought without them and then i think dane and saxon will be chaff before the wind of retribution run my son run for the good cause and for saxon england without a word i took the vellum and crammed it into my bosom and spun round on my heels and fled down the hillside and breasted the dewy tangles of fern and brambles and glided through the thickets and flying from ridge to ridge and leaping and running as though the silver wings of mercury were on my heels in an hour i dashed up the far hillside and panting and exhausted threw down the missive under the tawny beard of the great earl himself that scion of saxon royalty was as the monk had foreseen absorbed in the first meal of the day but he was too much of a soldier though 
like all his race a desperate good trencher man to let such a matter as my errand grow cold and no sooner had he read the scroll and put me a shrewd question or two than the order went forth for his detachments to arm and march at once but only a captain of many fights knows how slow reluctant troops can be in such case surely i thought as i stood by with crossed arms watching the preparations it was none of my business to help surely a nation though gallant enough which quits its breakfast board so tardily and takes such a perilous time to cross garter its legs and buckle on its blades and peak its beard and tag out its baldric so nicely when the invader is on foot surely such a nation is ripe to the fall and these comely english troops were doubly weary this morning for they were fresh as one of them told me from a hard fight in the far north of the kingdom where harold had just overthrown and slayed hadrada king of norway and the unduteous tosti harold's own brother less wonder then i found them travel-stained and weary no marvel for the once they were so slow to my fatal invitation it was noon before the english earl led off the van of his men and an hour later before i had seen the last of them out of the camp and followed reflective in the rear a place that never yet sorted with my mood wondering with the happy impartiality of my circumstances whether it were best this morning to be invader or invaded when we had gone a mile or two through the leafy tangles a hush fell upon the troop with which i rode and then with a shout we burst into a run for up from the valley beyond came the unmistakable sound of conflict and turmoil we breasted the last ridge i and two hundred men and there suddenly emerging into the open was the bloody valley of senlac beneath us and the sunny autumn sea beyond and at our feet right and left the wail and glitter and dust of nearly finished battle harold had fought without us and we saw the quick-coming forfeit he had to pay the unhappy saxons down there on the pleasant grassy undulations and among the yellow gorse and ling stood to it like warriors of good metal but already the day was lost the earl and his tardy troops had been merged into the general catastrophe and my handful would have been of naught avail the english array was broken and formless galled by the swarming norman bowmen the twang of whose strings we could mark even up here and fiercely assailed by foot and horsemen in the centre alone the english stood stubbornly shoulder to shoulder around the peaked flag at whose foot harold himself was grimly repelling the ceaseless onset of the foeman but alas for harold alas for the curly-headed son of ethelwulf and all the princes and peers with him we saw a mighty mass of foreign cavalry creeping round the shoulder of the hill like the shadow of a rain-cloud upon a sunny landscape we saw the thousand gonfalons of the spoilers fluttering in the wind we saw the glitter on the great throng of northern chivalry that crowded after the black charger of william normandy and the sacred flag a cursed ensign that tustane held aloft we saw their sweeping charge and then when it was past the battle was gone and done the saxon power was a hundred little groups dying bravely in different corners of the field the men with me that luckless afternoon melted away into the woods and i turned my steps once more to the little hill above senlac and my hermit's cell there the ill news had been brought by a wounded soldier and the women were filling the evening air with cries and weeping all that night they wept and wailed harold's wife leading them and when dawning came nothing would serve but she must go and find her husband's body much the good monk tried to dissuade her but to no purpose and swathing herself in a man's long cloak with one fair maiden likewise disguised and me for a guide before there was yet any light in the sky the brave norman girl set out and sorry was our errand and grim our success the field of battle was deserted save of dead and dying men on the dark wind of the night went up to heaven from it a great fitful moan 
as all the wounded groaned in unison to their unseen miseries alas those tender charges of mine had never seen till now the harvest field of war laid out with its swathes of dead and dying often they hesitated on that gloomy walk and hid their faces as the fitful clouds drifted over the scene and the changing light and shadows seemed to put a struggling ghastly life into the heaps of mangled corpses everywhere as we threaded the mazes of destruction or stepped unwitting in the darkness into pools of blood and mire were dead warriors in every shape and contortion lying all asprawl or piled up one on top of another or sleeping pleasantly in dreamless dissolution against the red sides of stricken horses and many were the pale blood besmeared faces of princes and chiefs my white-faced ladies turned up to the starlight and many were the sodden yellow curls they lifted with icy fingers from the dead faces of thanes and franklins until in an hour the norman girl who had gone a little apart from us suddenly stood still and then up to the clear black vault of heaven there went such a clear piercing shriek as hushed even the very midnight sorrows of the battlefield itself the king was found and editha the handmaiden too made her find presently and there over the dead prince's feet their left hands still clasping each other as when they had died were her father and her two stalwart brothers never did silenter courtiers than we six sit at a monarch's feet until the day should break and then we who lived covered the comely faces with the hems of their saxon tunics and were away as fast as we could go to the norman camp that the poor princess girl might beg a trophy of her victorious father we entered the camp without harm but had to stand by until the conqueror should leave his tent and enter the rough shelter that had already been erected for him here while we waited a young knight guessing editha's sex through her long cloak roughly pulled down the kerchief she was holding across her face whereupon i struck him so heavily with my fist that for a moment he reeled back against the horse he was leading and then out came his falchion and out came mine and we fell upon each other most heartily before a dozen passes had been made the bystanders separated us and at the same moment the normans set up a shout and the brand-new english tyrant strode out of his tent and encircled by a glittering throng entered the open audience hall adelisa dropped her white veil as he sat himself down and called to him and ran to the foot of his chair and wept and knelt so that even the stern son of robert the devil was moved and took her to him and stroked her hair and soothed and called her in norman french his pretty daughter and promised her the first boon she could think of and that boon was the body of harold in felix turn back the pages of history and you will see that she had her wish and waltham abbey its kingly patron exact historians say it was harold's mother who found his body upon the field of battle and offered william its weight in gold for it but our narrator ought to know the truth better than any of them meanwhile a knight led the weeping princess away to her father's tent but when i and editha would have followed two iron-coated rogues crossed their halberds in our path not so fast there my bulky champion called william the bastard to me what is this i heard about your striking a norman for glancing at yonder silly saxon wench by st denis your girls will have to learn to be more lenient whence come you what was your father's name i hardly know i said without thinking ah a too common ignorance nowadays sneered the conqueror turning to his laughing knights whereon wrathfully i replied at least my father never mistook under cover of the night a serving wench for a princess the shaft took the soldier in a very tender spot and his naturally sallow countenance blanched slowly to a hideous yellow as a smile went round the steel circle of his martial courtiers at my too telling answer yet even then i could not but do his iron will justice 
for the stern resolution with which the passion was restrained in that cold and cruel face and when he turned and spoke in the ear of his marshal standing near there was no tremor of anger or compassion in the inflexible voice with which he ordered me to be taken outside and hanged to the nearest tree that will bear him in ten minutes as for the saxon wench here des Ormeux, turning to a grim villain in steel harness at his side this girl has a good fief they say she and it are yours for the asking my mighty liege said the norman dropping on one knee never was a gift more generously given i will hold the land to your eternal service and make the maid free of my tent to-day and to-morrow we will look up a priest for the easing of her conscience loudly the assembled soldiers laughed as des Ormeux pounced upon the shrieking editha and bore her out of one door while in spite of my fierce struggles to get at him i was hustled into the open from another they dragged me into a green avenue between the huts of the invaders camp while they went for a rope to hang me with and as i stood thus loosely guarded and waiting among them down the norman ravisher came pacing towards us on his war-horse bound towards his tent with my white saxon flower fast gripped in front of him oh but he was proud to think himself possessed of a slice of fair english soil so easily and to have his courtship made so simple for him and he looked this way and that with an accursed grin upon his face no more heeding the tears and struggles of his victim than the falcon cares for the stricken pigeon's throes when they came opposite to us editha saw me and threw out her hands and shrieked to me and when i turned away my eyes and did not move surely it seemed as though her heart would have broken three more paces the war-horse made and then with the spring of a leopard thirsting for blood i was alongside of him another bound and i was on the crupper behind and there quicker than thought quicker than the lightning strikes down the pine tree i had lifted the norman steel shoulder plate and stabbed him with my long keen dagger so fiercely in the back that the point came out under his midrib and the red blood spurted to his horse's ears quicker too than it takes to tell i had gripped the maiden from the spoiler's dying hands and pushing his bloody body from the saddle had thrown my own legs over the crescent peak and before the gaping scullion soldiers comprehended my bold stroke for freedom i had turned the horse's head and was thundering through the camp towards the free green woods beyond and we reached them safely a rascal or two let fly their crossbows at us as we fled by and i heard the bolts hum merrily past my ears but they did no harm and there was mounting and galloping and shouting but the mailed normans were wonderfully slow in their stirrups i laughed to see them scrambling and struggling into their seats two or three men to every warrior who got safely up and we soon left them far behind down into the dip we rode my good horse spurning in his stride the still fresh bodies of yesterday's fighters and spinning the empty helmets and clattering through all the broken litter of the bitter contest until we swept up the inland slopes into the stunted birch and hazels and then turning for a moment to shake my fist at the nearest of the distant normans i headed into the leafy shelter and was speedily free from all chance of pursuit then and not before was there time to take a glance at my beautiful prize lying so gentle and light upon my breast alas every tint of colour had gone from her fair features and she lay there in my arms fainting and pulseless i loosened her neck scarf so i said fair saxon blossom this is destiny and you and i are henceforth to be joined together by the wondrous links of fate and stooping down as we paced through the pleasant green and white flicker of the silent wood i endorsed the immutable will of chance with a kiss upon her forehead presently she recovered and all that day we rode forward through the endless vistas of the southern woods by bridle tracks and swine paths until at nightfall far from other shelters we halted among the rocks and hollows of a little eminence no doubt my gentle comrade would have preferred a more peopled habitation but there was none in all that mighty wilderness so she like a wise girl 
submitted without complaint to that which she could not avoid there was naught much to tell you of this evening but it lives for ever in my memory for one particular which consorted strangely with the thoughts the flight with and rescue of editha had aroused i had found her a roomy hollow in the rocks and there had cut with my dagger and made a bed of rushes built a fire and got her some roots to eat and when darkness fell we talked for a time by the cheerful blaze without surprise i heard that though true saxon in name and face there was some british blood in her veins a fact indeed of which i had been certain without her assurance then she went on to tell with tearful pauses of the home and broad lands of which she was now lady paramount as well as of the gallant kinsman lying out yonder dead in the night dew and wept and sighed in gentle melancholy yet without the wild inconsolable grief latter times have taught to women until presently those tearful blue eyes grew heavier and heavier and the shapely chin dropped in grief and weariness upon her white breast and editha vorward slept in the hands of the stranger then i went out and looked at the blackness of the night over the sombre forest the shadowy pall of the evening was spread and a thousand stars gleamed brightly on every hand very still and strange was that unbroken fastness after the red turmoil of yesterday with nothing disturbing the silence but the cry of an owl to its mate across the coppices the tinkle of a falling streamlet and now and then the long hungry howling of a wolf or nearer by the sharp barking of the foxes i fed my horse then went in and pulled the fire together and fell a-ruminating my chin on my hands upon a hundred episodes of happiness and fear o oh, strange eternal powers who set the goings and comings of humanity what is the meaning of this wild riddle you are reading me i said presently aloud to myself o oh, hapi and amenti dark goddesses of the egyptians o oh, atropos lachesis clotho fatal sisters whom the romans dread mister skogula zernabok of these dark saxon shadows why am i thus chosen for this uncertain immortality when will this long drama this changeful history of my being end as i muttered thus to myself i glanced at the white girl sleeping in the ruddy blaze and saw her chest heave and then strange to tell stranger to hear with a sound like the whisper of a distant sea her lips parted and there came unmistakably the words never perhaps she was but dreaming of that amorous norman's fierce proposals and so again i mused is it possible some unfinished spell of that red high priestess of the druids plays this sport with me is it possible bloodwen's abiding affection stronger than time and changes accompanies me from age to age in these her sweet ambassadors for ever crossing my path tell me you comely sleeper tell me your embassy which is it that lasts longest life or love slowly again to my surprise those lips were parted and across the silent cavern came beyond mistake or question the word love at this very echo of my thoughts i stared hard at her who answered so appropriately but there could be no doubt editha was asleep with an unusually deep and perfect forgetfulness and when i had assured myself of this it was only possible for me to suppose those whispered words were some delusion the echo of my questioning again i brooded and then presently looked up and there by thor and odin twas as i write it between me and the bare earth and the tangled rootlets of the cavern side over against the fitful sparkle of the fire was a thin impalpable form that oscillated gently to the draughts creeping along the floor and grew taller and taller and took mortal air and shape and rose out of nebulous indistinctness into a fine ethereal substance and was clothed and visaged by the concentration of its impalpable material and there at last smiling and gentle in the flicker of the campfire the grey shadow of my british princess stood before me 
that man was never brave who has not feared and then for a moment i feared leaping to my feet and staggering back against the wall under the terrible sweetness of those eyes that burnt into my being with a relentless fire that i could not have shunned if i would and would not if i could for some time i was thus motionless and fascinated and then the gentle shadow who had been regarding me intently appeared to perceive the cause of my enthrallment and lifting a shapely arm of lavender-coloured essence for a minute veiled the terrible bewitchment of her face shrewd observant shadow as she did so i was myself again my blood welled into my empty veins my heart knocked fiercely at my ribs and when blodwyn lowered her hand there seemed to me endless enchantment but nothing dreadful in the glance of kindly wonder with which her eyes met mine surely it was as strange an encounter as ever there had been the little rocky recess all ruddy and shadowy in the dancing flames the silent white saxon girl there on the heaped-up rushes her breast heaving like a summer sea with a long smooth undulation and i against the stones one hand on my dagger and the other outspread fearful on the wall scarce knowing whether i were brave or not while against the eddying smoke calm passive happy immutable was that winsome presence shining in our dusky shelter with a tender violet light such as was never kindled by mortal means when i found voice to speak i poured forth my longings and pent-up spirit in many a reckless question but to all of them the princess made no answer then i spread my arms and thought to grasp her and ever as they nearly closed upon her she moved backwards now here and now there mocking my foolish hope and passing impalpable over the floor always gentle and compassionate until the uselessness of the pursuit at last dawned upon me and i stood irresolute i little doubt that immaterial immortal would have mustered courage or strength to speak to me presently but the sleeping girl sighed heavily at this moment and seemed so ill at ease that without a thought i turned to look at her when my eyes sought the opposite side of the fire again the presence was not half herself under my very glance she was being absorbed once more by the dusky air to let her go like that was all against my will and leaping to those printless feet princess wife i called stay another moment and as i said it i swept my arms round the last vestige of her airy kirtle and drew into my bosom an armful of empty air she had gone and not a sign was left not a palm's breadth of that lovely sheen shone against the wall as i arose ashamed from my knee and noticed editha was awaking my kind protector said that damsel i have been feeling so strange not dreaming quite but feeling as though some one were borrowing existence of me yet leaving in my body the blood and pulse of life now how can this be i must surely have been very tired yesterday no doubt you were fair franklin i answered yesterday was such a day as well excuses your weariness sleep again and when the sun rises in an hour you shall rise with it as fresh as any of the little birds that already preen themselves so she slept and presently i too all the next day we rode on through endless glades and briery paths towards editha's home and as we went i afoot and she meekly perched upon our mighty norman charger i wooed her with a brevity which the times excused and poured my nimble lover wit into ears accustomed only to the sluggish flattery of woodland thanes and princely swineherds and first she blushed and would not listen and then she sighed and switched the low wet boughs of oak and hazel as we passed along and then she let me say my say with downcast averted eyes and a sweet reluctance which told me i might stoutly push the siege as we went we picked up now and then a straggling soldier or two from the fight behind us and now and then a petty chieftain joined us until presently we wound through the bracken towards Vorwood, a very goodly train editha had got a palfrey and i my horse again 
but as she neared her home the thought of its desolation weighed heavier and heavier upon her tender nature she would not eat and would not speak and at last took her to crying and so cried until we saw a glint through the oak stems a very fair homestead and ample with broad lands around and kine and deer about it and all that could make it fair and pleasant this was her volwood and when the servants came running to meet us knowing nothing of the fight or its results and thinking we were their master and his sons come again with waving caps and shouts of pleasure it was too much for the overwrought girl she threw up her white hands and with a cry of pain and grief slipped fainting from her palfrey before us all then might you have seen a score of saddles featly emptied to the service of the heiress down jumped offer the dane whose unchanged doublet was still red to his chin with mud and norman gore down jumped edred and egbert those blue-eyed brothers who had left their lands by the northern sea a month ago to follow harold's luckless banner torquil the grim and wolf hair of the white beard sprang to the ground and cluin the fair welsh princeling and his shadow idwa lacunan the harper warrior vaulted to their feet spent and battle-weary as they were with many another but lighter and quicker than any of them fra the phoenician had leapt to earth and stood there astride of the senseless girl his hand upon his dagger hilt and scowling round that soldier circle wrathful to think that any other but he should touch her then he took her up as if it were a mother with a sleeping babe and the serfs uncapped and stood back on either hand and the grim warriors fell in behind and so editha came home her loose arms hanging down and her long bright hair all adrift over the broad shoulders of the strangest most many adventured soldier in that motley band End of chapter five